welcome back to our fourth episode of Tuesday Talks with Bob. Um, today's episode is going to be short and sweet. We're going to talk a little bit about planting times, um, some basic agricultural information, and some of Bob's favorite books and movies. So please join us. Um, as always, I'm your host, Emily. And I'm Sarah. And we look forward to this episode. Yep. And as always, our guest of honor will be Dr. Patterson, but this is an introduction, so he's not here, and we'll see you in the next clip. <laughs> see ya. <laughs> Hey y'all, welcome to episode four. Um, we're really excited. So we're gonna jump right on into our questions. So question number one. When should you plant corn? You should plant corn when you really believe with your head and your heart that this will be the outcome. How in the world can we say to ourselves if we plant it today and tomorrow the outcome will be this and not something else. <laughs> when I was your age, I was taught you put a thermometer in the soil. It can be a real simple one like this or it can be a more complicated one like this. You want the sensitive part of the thermometer to be at seeding depth. Mm -hmm. Let's say two and a half inches down into the soil. and. When I was your age, at eight o'clock in the morning, on three consecutive mornings, when the soil temperature was 60.0 degrees or higher, you cranked up the tractor and you started planting. <laughs> Today, according to Ron Hanniger and others who understand this very well, that temperature, that seeding depth has been dropped down to 59, 58, 57, and Ron said, Bob, it's okay to say 55 if, you, if the outlook for weather is good. So I'm gonna say, when do you plant corn? You plant corn when, this, when the temperature is sitting depth at eight o'clock in the morning is at least 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this is that that corn seed is sound asleep until it starts to wake up. And it starts to wake up when moisture moves through the seed coat and increases the solubility of the seed coat or the pericarp to oxygen. And as you all well know, uh, you, you've got to have you got to have water to convert the starch to sugar by hydrolysis, and you've got to have oxygen for aerobic respiration. So if the soil temperature is suitable and you have the good balance of large pores and small pores, micro and micro pores, so that some oxygen can move into the effective rooting zone that will occur very soon, then you should, you should start planting corn and keep planting until you get it all planted. And then, and then you can start resting well and say, I did, I did the first part right. And I'm optimistic that if all else goes right, then this will be the outcome. So you want to plant corn in different, depending on where in North Carolina you are, either, either uh, in late March and very early April, mm -hmm. east of us, mm -hmm. and west of us, depending on where you are west of us, let's say the first to the middle of April, generally speaking. Now you can plant it later and still get a good yield, and you can plant it earlier and get a good yield. But on average, if we look at a lot of years of data that I've seen with Ron Heidegger, it's true that you need to, you need to think in terms of planting corn just about the first, the first, you could, let's say the third or the fourth week of March, early April, east of Raleigh, and early to mid-April, Mm -hmm. West of Raleigh. Don't plant it too late. You can you can plant it too late as well as too early. Mm -hmm. We're going to take our CS214 lab class to Central Crop Research Station next Thursday and plant corn, assuming weather permits. And I'm excited because I think the situation is perfect for planting corn this coming mm -hmm. Thursday yeah. afternoon. That's exciting. It is exciting. Well, I see a good looking corn plant right there. You want to show everybody what oh it looks like? Oh my gosh, yes. I want to. And that, 
that sort of leads into your second question. A little bit. This, this corn plant was, was grown in a controlled environment. The, the phytotron on the other side of Gardner Hall. And until it, until recently, it had a good balance of nutrients and everything was, do, was going fine. The lower leaves were green as well as the upper leaves. And what we know is that when the upper six, seven, or eight leaves are, are green, green as healthy grass, then good yields can follow. When you ask me the correct color of a tractor, yes. the only answer I can give you is, is just deep, deep green. It needs to be bright, deep green. John Deere Green. Because if the photosynthetic tissue is green, then there's a potential for a good, a good outcome of the corn crop. So what we want is all the leaves above the ear node to be as green as they can be because these are the leaves that are gonna fix the carbon, transfer it to the developing ear so that the outcome can be as close as possible to the genetic potential of this variety in this environment. Now, it's just as important that the leaves below the top ear node be as green as they can be also because the hidden half, the part of the plant that we don't see, is just as important as the part that we can see because this plant is only going to do well when the root system is healthy and also does well. So if you've planted your crop at the right time, it's not too wet, it's not too dry, you've got a good balance of large and small pores, then oxygen can continue to move into the soil and reach every living cell in the root system. And if those root cells get oxygen, then they can aerobically respire and, and the root system will be healthy. And when it translocates the nutrients and the water up to the shoot, the shoot is happy and healthy as well. The, the roots and the shoots both smile and the outcome is going to be something that we can market. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's what I really believe strongly is that it, ha it needs to be green. And if it's green, then all is going to be well. You've heard us talk about Bill Fike a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Fike was my mentor. Bill kept saying, Bob, tell your students to keep their fields green in winter and there's a reason for that a green field is going to provide us with what we want to talk about in your third question i think <laughs> so this plant is going to do well so long as the leaves are green yeah. and let's do all we can to keep that field green as green as we can until until this plant reaches physiological seed maturity. And that's when the seed of the crop has accumulated all the dry matter that is capable of accumulating mm -hmm. under those growing conditions. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I'm sorry, I'm giving you another lecture. You don't need We're another good. lecture it's from great. Bob. It's great, You don't need another it. lecture from Bob. So what would you say to anyone that doesn't think green is the right color tractor? I think that they surely have a good reason for believing that. The, I know that there's some there's some red tractors, there's some different color tractors, or yep, there are many different colors of tractors, and I'm very comfortable with with a tractor being any color mm -hmm. that the person who's going to drive that tractor feels comfortable having that color and driving that tractor. What matters is not the color of the tractor. What matters is that that tractor function the way it needs to function in order mm -hmm. for the work to be done that needs to be done. Green is my favorite because I know in the heart of hearts that the outcome of that tractor operation has to be a green plant in mm -hmm. order for that farm family that owns that tractor to feel a, feel comfortable yeah. mm -hmm. about 
how they invested their resources. Yeah. What a diplomatic answer. <laughs> All right. I, I know there's some, I know there's some other colors and and, um, and is it okay for me to ask y'all what your favorite colors are of the tractor? Mm, um, green, green. Yep. Now was, was it that way before I started? This? We we use always green. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that when when my mother did her darning and knitting. She used a lot of green material. Mm -hmm. See, it's the best material. color. And I would say, it's Mother, what, what, um, what causes you to use so much green? Bobby, it's my favorite color. Aww. And then, and when my mother said that, that, that took care of it. Oh, that's <laughs> sweet. Yeah. And so when I would go out and look at, look in the pasture growing up, and if, if the if the pasture grass was green, uh, that reminded me of my mother. Aww. And when I was able to be anything that helped me remind myself of my mother, my day was better for Aww. it always. That's yeah. so sweet. I'm telling you the truth. Oh, <laughs> she was so. My mother was um, God's blessing mm -hmm. to our family. Aww. That is so sweet. <laughs> what a heartfelt answer! My God. <laughs> So, what is your favorite ag movie or book? Well, I've been thinking about this, and I can't give you just one answer. <laughs> Y'all said that it would be okay if I <laughs> went beyond, and yep. there is one that one, the, the first one of all these that I'm going to share with you. The first one that I looked that I saw. Uh, visually, having read it, and then when I found out that it, that there was, a, I think it, it, it is Netflix. Yeah. How this is called "Kiss the Ground." How the food you eat can reverse can reverse climate change. Gosh, I, I sure hope it can heal your body and ultimately save our world. There, there are so many thoughts about this. I would I would like to say that through fascinating and accessible interviews with celebrity chefs, ranchers, farmers, and top scientists, this remarkable book will teach you how to become an agent in humanity's single most important and time sensitive mission. Learn how to reverse climate change and effectively save the world, all through the choices you make and how and what to eat and how to provide the food that we do eat. I, I this, this book uh, is very special to me. On the back cover, save the soil, save the world. Oh, I like that quote. Mm -hmm. Save the like soil, that. save the world. There's a book written by Timothy Wise. I have uh, seen a portion of the video of this book. I've read the book, Eating Tomorrow, Agribusiness, Family Farmers, and the Battle for the Future of Food. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very special book. It's a wake-up call about the future of food. It's a tour de force on the global struggle for economic, social, and cultural rights, guided by a writer who takes us into corporate boardrooms and farmers' fields. The most important sound that a corn crop ever hears, if this corn crop is growing in the field, Students, what is the most important sound it could ever hear? The footsteps of the farmer. If that corn plant hears the farmer's footsteps, that corn plant knows that that farmer cares for that plant, has gone out into the field to help to the best of his ability and her ability to make sure that that, that corn crop is healthy and happy.
Gary Paul Nabhan, where our food comes from, is another another source that uh, has meant a lot to me, the written version, and there's also a video version that I've had a chance to to view parts of it, not all of it, but I've read the entire book. And he has come here to this campus and given a wonderful lecture on this subject. And, and what, what he is basically saying is that he is telling us that this book pays homage to a martyr who understood that crop varieties must be preserved for future food security of the human race. As Nabhan points out, the risk today is no less than in Babylon's time, and it may be greater. What we know is that the greatest extent of genetic variability, the most precious crop germplasm, is that germplasm that exists where that particular genotype, that crop originated. It has had its greatest opportunity to diver, diverge, go in different directions genetically. We have the gen greatest genetic variability at the center of origin of a crop, and that's why we must preserve it. Vavilov goes into a lot of uh, this in, in, in his work in where, where he had his um, place in what is today in, in Russia, and Nabhan speaks to that very well. So what I believe is if we read this book and if we view the, the um, video that's come from the book, then we will really appreciate knowing that we must preserve and protect the center of origin and also the center of diversity of our crops. There's, there's a single center of origin and there are multiple centers of diversity of each germplasm. And, and Vavilov went all over the world bringing material back and he wanted to preserve it. And um, Nabhan goes into the, into the way that he attempted to do that very well. And then the final, the final book that, that I cannot resist mentioning, and there, there's a video version of parts of this book also, Fred Magdolf and Harold Van Ness. Fred and I were, were grad students together up at Cornell, and Fred and I are very good friends. He was a wonderful third baseman uh, on our baseball, softball team, but we, we, we never were able to beat uh, chemistry. We could be, we'd beat a lot of other teams, but we couldn't beat chemistry. <laughs> it wasn't Fred's fault, it was Bob's fault that we didn't. Building Soils for Better Crops. This is the fourth edition. There are three earlier editions that were good, this fourth edition is incredible. Ecological management for healthy soils. And when I look through this book, I'm reminded of, of what Herman Warsaw said, and I've mentioned this before. The world champion corn farmer up in Saybrook, Illinois, responding to my grad student Wayne Nixon's question. By the way, Wayne was a very special person in our agronomy club years ago, very involved. And, and if he knew how wonderful you folks have taken our agronomy club in so many one splendid directions Wayne would be very happy I'm going to tell him about how, how wonderful our agronomy club is today so Mr. Warsaw was answering Wayne's question Mr. Warsaw how did you do this how did you grow such a healthy crop Wayne I try to do right by my soil knowing that if I do good yields will follow and it, this book has a lot to do with how seriously we must take the matter of preserving and increasing to the extent possible soil health. There's some information on regenerative agriculture. Not only can we sustain the soil as, we, as it has been for our parents and grandparents' generation, but can we restore it? Can we go back to an earlier time? So not only can we sustain, but can we regenerate the, the uh, earlier condition. Rarely does a book combine genuine scientific insights with practical advice like this book. It focuses on using ecological principles to improve soil health, while also, this is important students, while also touching on the broader social concerns with healthy food, and environmental sustainability.
farming profitably in a time of climate change and concerns about fossil fuels, water resources, and nutrients requires a holistic, holistic students, a holistic understanding and practical answers for translating science into action. Easily accessible, well prepared, this book is a must read for beginners and experienced professionals alike. And, and, and since there is a video version available of some of it, I encourage you to try your best to find it or you're welcome to use. I've got several copies of this book in my office. I would love to share with you. So where we are in these wonderful questions is how can we respect our soil and our land around the soil and the crop growing in the soil so that the outcome is what we want it to be rather than what it would be if we weren't paying careful attention to all that we know to be true. There's absolutely no reason for us to have to harvest an ear of corn like this. We have been blessed with the opportunity in terms of resources and knowledge mm -hmm. to go in this direction. And we need to be thankful that we have choices. There, yes, sir, you've got so many choices. The challenge is to find out which of all these choices that are available to us are the right ones. And, and the fact that y'all are here on this campus, being the wonderful and the incredible students that you are, means that you want to make the right choices. And we, those of us who are blessed to work with you in the classroom and in the lab, we know in our heart of hearts that you are going to make the right choices when your opportunity permits itself following the time you turn your tassel the last time and you're going to make the right choices because you want to we're so proud of you well, thank and you, thank you for all that you're doing for our university community it goes way beyond Williams Hall thank you thank you seriously thank you <laughs> Well, I think that was a nice, short, and sweet episode. Yes, exactly. Well, I, I hope it's not too long. I, I know, no, it's I, I know, I ramble. I go off in too many directions. <laughs> it was perfect. But I, I will say that there, there is an opportunity for all of you and your families to eat tomorrow because your family wants you to eat tomorrow today. Mm -hmm. Well, that was really good. I love it. Um, Thank we... you so much. <laughs> Thank you for You're the welcome. opportunity. Well, we hope you enjoyed this nice, short, and sweet episode of Tuesday Talks with Bob. Um, we'll see you next episode. Yep. Bye, Thanks. Guys. Bye. <laughs>